Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. This is episode number 758. My name is Camden Busey, and I'm here in Libertyville, Illinois, uh, with some good friends to discuss uh, not only Reformed theology, but even more specifically, one of the minor prophets. Let me introduce to you today our panel. We have with us first Ryan Noah, who serves as the Director of Education and Advancement here at Reformed Forum. We have him here in studio as we're building this studio out. Welcome, Ryan. It's good to see you. Thanks, Cameron. It's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, What would you have to say for the progress of our humble abode? Oh, it's coming along. Um, uh, If you were to walk in the doors right now, it would look like we're uh, in business selling library shelving. Um, (laughs) So we have a few few more things to put up, but uh, our offices are together. Uh, We're preparing for an in-person course, so Mm -hmm. we hope to host people in the building very soon. Um, We have a, a nice little office set aside where our intern is working on uh, our podcasts and and our coursework. So uh, Mm -hmm. we're we're fully operational. It just doesn't quite look like it yet in in some respects. Oh, well, I'm excited to be here and we are working things out to get, trying to get the studio all sorted out. And uh, that involves, you know, a bunch of cables and stuff that are (laughs) in process. So uh, Ryan and I are working through this, but for the moment we can see and hear our guest, and we're happy to uh, to have him with us. We're going to introduce to you, of course, somebody many of you know pretty well, should know his voice very well. We have Mark Winder, who's pastor of Wolf River Presbyterian Church in Collierville, Tennessee. He also serves uh, as the host of our program, Proclaiming Christ. Welcome back, Mark. So good to see you. How are you doing? Oh, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, we got an exciting, uh, exciting episode lined up as we're going to be speaking about an upcoming event and an upcoming course here at Reformed Forum. Uh, in addition to moving into the studio, we're doing that so that we can have in-person events. Part of the, the whole plan and purpose of moving here is to have more space so that we can host people and uh, do different events. And uh, we have Mark on the schedule uh, to teach a course on none other than Zephaniah. It's going to be our first in-person course here in the studio. Ryan, a uh, uh, First off, I mean, I'll let you kick things off by explaining what we're doing here with uh, the courses and whatnot. But do we have any other items of news or information that we need to let people know about? Um, well, we should have registration up for our fall conference on uh, Meredith Klein very soon. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. We'll be back in Gray's Lake, Lord willing. Uh, that'll be uh, the pre-conference event, which you won't want to miss. It'll be on September 30th. And then the following day, we'll have our main conference. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, we just booked uh, travel and hotel for uh, Dr. Tipton, our fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology here at Reform Forum. He'll be coming back in uh, to uh, deliver another five-hour course in our fellow, fellowship in Reformed Apologetics on the Theology and Apologetics of Van Til. This time, he's come around to it. He's addressing the apologetic method. Of Cornelius Van Til. Oh, so yeah. we're really excited about that. He's he's working hard on the material, honing mm-hmm. it, uh, perfecting it. Uh, so we can't wait to have him come in in August. So yeah, that's all part of the, the larger program of having, as you mentioned, that uh, Fellowship and Reformed Apologetics, which is eight courses that we have scheduled uh, all on the theology and apologetics of Van Til. So this will be course number five. Course number five. And... Uh, We'll do another in November, Lord willing, and then hopefully two more in 2023. So we should be complete with, finished with the fellowship by uh, next year. Then we'll have a whole, I mean, comprehensive list of courses all available for free online. And uh, we're working on uh, getting those out into print as well, uh, modified editions on that. And uh, where are we with the book? We have the Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, which should show up. Maybe in in a week or two? Yeah, we're hoping uh, the estimate was mid-July. So, Lord willing, that's a plan. And uh, we hope to have a big uh, deluxe pre-sale mm-hmm. uh, yet to be announced, which uh, it, it'll it'll strangely warm the hearts of, of, of Ventilians <laughs> out there. I know I will be purchasing one at, at full price. I, I just can't wait for it. <laughs> we'll give a little a little preview uh, that we'll, part of this, this bundle will be a Ventil challenge coin. Right. We have those. So we haven't posted any photos of them, but uh, they'll go along with the Machen Challenge coin, which have been long gone for for a long time. 
But uh, now we've got a Van Til challenge coin, not just in the works, but in our hands. So it's <laughs> that'll be shipping out with a kind of a deluxe, you know, intro bundle. If you want to get the book along with some other fun limited edition goodies, uh, we'll have it all available for you soon at reformedforum.org. Uh, and you'll find uh, information on that. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on, please subscribe to our email newsletter because that's really where we announce all this stuff as soon as it happens. You know, follow us on Twitter. Yes, please. Visit the website, reformedforum.org, but subscribe to the email newsletter. Uh, you can do so right on the website. And if you do that, you'll get all of this information. We send out a weekly newsletter, so we're not bombing you with tons of emails or anything. But when you subscribe to that, you get updates not only about our new content, especially our courses and uh, new podcast episodes, the short answers to big questions video series. We, we pop those into the email newsletter frequently as well. But uh, whenever we're doing a sale like we had on Gaffin's In the Fullness of Time, and we've got some other big sales on new books, not just books we publish, but books other people publish in conjunction with podcast episodes, we'll have those all uh, in the feed as well and in the email newsletter. So enough of all that, but let's talk now about this course. And uh, you and Mark, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, the course on Zephaniah? Perhaps, Ryan, you can explain kind of our strategy and what we're seeking to do now, because this is the first course we're doing that is explicitly a Bible study. All of our courses are dealing with the Bible, but now we're we're treading into new waters and hopefully going to be endeavoring in a, in a long-term project here to cover the Bible from a redemptive historical perspective. Yeah, that's right. Lord willing, this is number one out of 66 Bible studies hmm. that we will be uh, recording for our Reformed Academy. We hope to make them all available uh, for free on demand. And Lord willing, for many of these, we hope to offer, like we plan to do in August with our brother Mark Winder, uh, in-person instruction. Um, what, what greater joy can we have, uh, you know, when our joy is made complete, seeing each other face to face? Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. We love to connect uh, with, with you, our friends and listeners and, and donors. And so um, we're going to be uh, opening up the prophecy of Zephaniah uh, in a study by Mark Winder that's called Zephaniah's Protology hey, hey. and Eschatology, a major theme in a minor prophet. Mark, my, Ryan could not stop talking about your subtitle. He just he just thought I'm that sorry. was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Which I think it's great too, but I mean, right. like that was the hubbub in the office for a, a day or two. Oh, good. good. <laughs> and so and so this is this comes originally. Um, it's it's the fruit of much further reflection, uh, but it comes originally from. Uh, Dr. Winder's thesis that he did at, at RTS. Oh, yeah, I got it right there with my original binding. Um, but this is not going to be a, a technical study where he's talking about the Talmud and text criticism and all this and that. Um, this is going to be one that's going to, Lord willing, uh, build up the saints in their ability to, to see and savor the gospel of Jesus Christ, the sufferings and glories of our Savior, as he's progressively revealed from the garden to the new creation. And uh, we're going to focus in on that in uh, the prophecy of, Zeph of Zephaniah. And uh, cr so Christians of all educational backgrounds um, and, and denominations, if you love Jesus and you want to uh, understand how he, uh, how he saves us from sin uh, through his cross and resurrection and ascension and his coming again, uh, join us. And uh, we'll open up the scriptures together and, and Lord willing, be, be made wise unto salvation. That's, that's really the goal. We want to, we want to serve the church. Uh, we realize at Reform Forum, uh, in a number of our podcasts, we, we hit, you know, kind of the, uh, that level of, of theological eggheadedness uh, mm. that, that is, is helpful for, for ministers and seminary students and, uh, you know, the very thoughtful uh, layperson. But we want to do something that is, is for the everyday saints uh, who are, you know, working six days a week out of the home or, or in the home and uh, want to pick up their Bible and, uh, and go deeper into the Word of God and uh, learn to see Jesus Christ therein as, as totally sufficient for uh, his people. Uh, Mark, why don't you tell us a bit about um, having taught this uh, at the Sunday school level? I know you've done that at your church before with, some, with a rather lengthy study, which was great. I listened to many of the lessons there. Uh, but that might lead us into uh, the specific format of this course, and, and maybe Ryan, after that, you can we can uh, discuss the 
the layout of this course and what our objectives are for the at least the in-person aspect of it? Well, one of the reasons I'm particularly excited about this is because after having done, I believe we're at an episode 111 or 112, something like that, of proclaiming Christ, is getting to see uh, how this is done in a book that, well, nobody knows how to spell, first of all, and nobody really quite knows <laughs> where it is. Sure. It, it, you know, it's a minor profit, right? Which means it's not important, uh, I think, in the way that, you know, some people may think, when's the last time you've heard a sermon on Zephaniah? And yet encapsulated within this little book, three whole chapters, uh, you have a programmatic theme. I mean, the theme, I, I think. And I'll I get into that just a little bit more later. But the theme of the Bible, if I could be so bold, that you find in the book of Zephaniah that takes you from Genesis 1, at least Genesis 1-2, all the way to the book of Revelation, and that is the coming of God, uh, the day of the Lord. And to see that in this minor prophet, this major theme in this minor prophet, and how this points us to Jesus Christ is is what I'm excited about. So my, my hope is that in each of these lessons, what, what we're not going to do is and, you know, Ryan's right, where there's not going to be a hyper-technical study, although I think it would be useful for seminary students, even mm -hmm. for ministers. There's certainly material here that mm -hmm. I, I don't think I got in seminary, but it's not going to be hyper-technical. Uh, we're not going to discuss textual criticism, you know, and there's actually not that much to discuss. In Zephaniah, the, the text is is really not very contested in terms of what we have. There is, there is certainly a critical opinion about the text, certain portions of the text, but we won't get into that other than simply mentioning it. I want to break down the text, and our plan would be in each of the lessons uh, not to save till the end of where we see Christ so clearly disclosed for us or anticipated in Zephaniah, but do it in each lesson, break these down. And, and Zephaniah in some ways is similar to Jeremiah and Amos, in that there you can read it and as you read it think there's not a lot of good news here <laughs> right. uh, but there is all throughout it if you recognize that the day of the lord brings both judgment and salvation simultaneously mm -hmm. and that's seen throughout the book so it came out of uh, teaching preaching it a fascination with a book that quite frankly the reason why i tackled zephaniah to begin with is because i love preaching from the old testament i've preached through uh, the book of Genesis, which was just a wonderful journey. And one of the exciting things about preaching through the Old Testament is being able to, if you will, complete the picture, the anticipation that we find, particularly in prophetic books, but you find it all throughout. You find it in the writings, you find it in uh, the Pentateuch, the anticipation of the coming of God and who comes, Christ comes. And so I love that journey. Uh, somebody once, I think, pejoratively referred to redemptive historical preaching as bicycling through the Bible, but that's actually a pretty good description uh, because that's what we do. We're bicycling through the Bible, and what you find in Zephaniah is Pentateuchal themes, creation themes, redemptive themes, and, and my interest in that was, here's an unknown book that mm -hmm. I've never heard a sermon on and doesn't mention Christ. It's covenantal at its core, but never once is the word covenant used. How can we open this book up? And where is Christ here? How do we see Christ here? And do we see it in a legitimate way? And so that's what uh, captured my interest initially. And uh, boy, the, the treasures that are here are deep. Absolutely. Yeah, it was interesting uh, to study this. I, I uh, could have just uh, plagiarized you, but I didn't. Uh, I wrote a book, a little bit book on Zephaniah as well, Lamentations, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, but it's just a tiny little thing because I think I only have three lessons uh, on Zephaniah. But just in that little amount of time to preach through the book and then, you know, develop these lessons based on sermons I preached through it, it it, it was just an, an, a beautiful thing. The covenantal themes there, the redemptive historical themes are rich as they are in any book of the Bible. But this is one of those books, as you mentioned, where a lot of people wouldn't even know where it is in the Bible or how to spell it, uh, or that it's not the same as Zechariah, for example, or Zechariah, <laughs> whatever. And so, it, you know, it, 
this tiny little book of a few chapters is is still incredibly well, not incredibly, but uh, certainly believably rich because it it's a word from our Lord, our God, our covenantally faithful God. But uh, I would very much encourage people to to read it and to study it. And that's kind of what we're trying to get at with these courses, especially having one in person that we can we can not only work through scripture and just give people information, uh, but the point is so that they would not only come to know their God better as he has revealed himself throughout all of scripture, but they would also know how better to read their Bibles and to interpret them uh, with a redemptive historical hermeneutic, which I believe is a faithful way to, to read and, and interpret the Bible. It's how the apostles uh, teach us, I believe, and how the New Testament teaches us to read and understand that Christ is the fulfillment and consummation of all things. And we see those promises uh, laid out for us very clearly in the book of Zephaniah, as in all the minor prophets and, and all of Scripture, but we're going to focus in on Zephaniah. Ryan, tell us about the format of this class. Uh, we can go over a couple details. We can do that at the end as well, but I'd like to, for people just to get a foretaste. What could they expect if they register for this course, August 12th and 13th, right? 2022, in case somebody's listening you know, out into the future. What can they expect if they come here to the studio in, in northern suburbia of Chicago, northern Chicago land, step into this course on a Friday evening and a Saturday morning? What's going to happen? You can expect, first of all, a very warm welcome from us at, at Reform Forum as we open up the uh, the doors to you at uh, around about uh, 6.30 or, or 6 o'clock, I forget, on the Friday evening. Uh, we'll have some time for light refreshments and, and to, to get to know you and, and hear about uh, the Lord's work in your life. And then uh, we'll get right into our the first of our 12 scheduled lessons out of Zephaniah. Uh, Lord willing, in this class, you'll be able to hear 12 30-minute uh, presentations. I think it's 10. Oh, yes. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah. But I can yeah. come up with two more. If you no, know. no, 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 no. <laughs> it's 10, yeah. Yeah, it's 10. I, 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 my math, 12 times 30, I, I've gotten it wrong about 15 no, times. and I'm the one looking at the schedule, too. So we've got, we got four on the first night. So yeah. 530 registration will start. At 6 o'clock, the lesson one will begin. So we'll have four lessons that first evening. will be done by 9 p.m. And then, uh, Lord willing, on Saturday, we'll start bright and early with the first, uh, we'll have an arrival and, and time of refreshments from, from 7.30 to 8 a.m. But the first lesson, lesson five for Saturday, will start at 8 a.m. And then it'll finish by 12.30. So it's scheduled. It's, there's a lot. It's, it's dense. Now, it's Sunday school material. Uh, it's, it's rich. It's deep. But it's accessible, should be, to anybody that, that comes. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's packed in. Uh, but we get through all of this material on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. So, you you know, if you're at least in the ballpark or in the area, you'd be able to get home. Right. You'd probably only be have to miss one Lord's day of worship. work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Lord willing, we're, we also have scheduled in um, some some buffer between the lessons uh, so as to allow for a natural feel and some questions and answers to yeah. and, and personal interaction with uh, with Mark. Um, so we, we really look forward to that. A lot of times those, those Q&A sessions are where, you know, the, the gems are, are really uh, revealed. Oh, sure. You know, and you, can, you, you might have a question that's just been gnawing at you the whole time. And, mm -hmm. and you know, Lord willing, it could be illumined uh, by, by the instructor and, and, and the Word of God. So, yeah, we can't, we can't wait to welcome you here in, uh, in Lincolnshire, Libertyville. Yeah, Mark will, Mark be, staying will be staying in, staying in Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> our hotel in Libertyville way. was was booked up. I don't know what's going on in Libertyville that weekend, but uh, the the nearest hotel, the oh, one we frequently the, use, it's this class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they've already booked it well <laughs> right. in advance. Right. I, oh, sh I should mention too that we are speaking of Libertyville. Our location is just absolutely prime for we're, we're right at the end of the main strip, one of the best restaurant districts in. The northern suburbs, I would say, and so we hope after the 9 p.m. you know stop here at the office. When according to our lease, we should we should be wrapping things up. We hope to have extended fellowship uh, that Friday evening and be able to continue to uh, to just build in the Lord and encourage one yeah, another and, and continue street. to meditate on the things that we've we've learned from the Word of God. So uh, yeah. there'll be ample time even outside of the right. in-person instruction uh, to be able to to get to know one another, encourage each other, etc. Yeah, and people, you know, we won't be uh, having full meals here. Here, we'll have snacks and whatnot available. But even after on Saturday, after it uh, ends at twelve thirty, I'm sure many people will be going out for lunch uh, nearby. So, 
uh, if you'd like to come, uh, we'd love to have you. And it should be really, a really great opportunity to discuss, get to know people, mm-hmm. hopefully to build some friendships and relationships with others. Um, and, uh, to bond around uh, the word of God and mm-hmm. uh, a shared commitment to, to this approach to scripture, which we believe is, uh, most faithful. And I hope to get to be able to meet some folks too, if yeah. folks can make it after doing, you know, we've only done, I guess, again, like maybe 100, 1112 episodes of Proclaim Christ, but we've been doing it for seven or eight or nine years. Yeah, exactly. So we, you know, mm-hmm. we, we haven't put them up with the kind of a consistency I'd love to, but I know we have some listeners and I, I quite a few, and I would love to be able, if we can, to meet some of those folks uh, because the Reform Forum Conference takes place uh, when it does on the timetable, that usually lands right between two other meetings that I have to go to. I, yeah. I've only been able to come to one or two of them. Uh, so I would look forward to getting to meet some folks and some of whom I, I imagine are listeners or have listened to proclaim Amen. Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd love to we'd love to connect people to you. We really look forward to that. I should mention we should mention the price too. Yeah, just just forty nine dollars for the general admission, and if you're a you're a full time student, twenty five dollars. So we, we're seeking to make this accessible. Uh, so we, we really would love to have you in studio. Yeah, that's five hours of uh, instruction time in addition to all the other fellowship time and whatnot. So we're trying to make it accessible. We should mention uh, that if you come, uh, you know, uh, this is going to be recorded and it is going to be produced and made available for free on Reformed Academy. So it's part of a video curriculum. Uh, so... Uh, just be aware of that if you're if you're coming. Um, I think that's a plus, but there, there there's also great advantage to being here, as we mentioned. Even though the video material and audio will be available online later for free, uh, I would just look at that as an opportunity to review because being here in person is the opportunity that you have, not on camera, but uh, the opportunity that you have to ask questions and interact not only with the with other students, but with the teacher as well. Mm-hmm. I learn the best that way. That's that's how best I learn. Um, but the second best way is obviously listening and reading. Uh, but um, being able to interact is a way to own the material and to um, integrate it into, into our other parts of knowledge. So I'm looking forward to doing that and learning about Zephaniah myself. Mm. Mark, how have you broken this uh, course down? What do you what are you looking to accomplish? Is this largely um, uh, major pericopes? Are you doing this uh, topically? Why don't you tell the listeners and tell us how you're structuring this? Largely going to be exegetically based. So I mm-hmm. want to walk through the book. It's a small enough book with just three chapters that I think we can walk through it. And as we come to the major themes, we can unpack those themes. Uh, so <clears throat> the first two lessons are going to be uh, prolegomena and context. So the the beginning is going to be exploring, and this is, you know, a fairly basic overview of covenant theology. What are the covenants? How do they function? And how do we see that covenantal arrangement in the book of Zephaniah, which I think Zephaniah has a covenantal arrangement to it. So we'll look at some of those aspects or the, the various components of a covenant um, we'll, of course, be uh, leaning on uh, on Klein uh, here in terms of the way that he outlined the book of Deuteronomy, and we can see a similar outlining in the book of Zephaniah. We can't impose that too uh, strictly on the text. We're not trying to impose anything from the text. We want to see it arise naturally out of the text, but I think it does. And so we'll spend some time exploring the covenantal theme that's there. And again, even though the word covenant isn't used. Kessid never appears in the book of Zephaniah, which is interesting uh, to me. In fact, this would be an interesting study that somebody could do some time, is why is Kessid all over the Old Testament, but when you get to the minor prophets, other than Hosea, for obvious Mm. reasons, right? He's covenantal relationship with with, uh, Gomer. Uh, Other than Hosea, why does the word Kessid almost disappear? And so you don't see that theme in terms of the word itself, but the theme as a structure is all over the book, particularly we're going to see Deuteronomic themes. And we shouldn't be surprised at the Deuteronomic themes that we find in the book of Zephaniah because Zephaniah is writing around the time of Josiah's reforms. Now, some folks uh, think that Zephaniah is writing before the reforms because of the very bold way and somewhat detailed way in which he enumerates the sins of 
the people of Judah. Uh, but uh, I think that the the Deuteronomic themes that we find in Zephaniah point to a rediscovery of the law. That's why he's prosecuting the law in the way that he has. So I think it's probably written when Josiah is in his 20s, maybe something like that. He discovered Josiah discovers the law uh, eight, 12 years after he reigns, he comes to power at, at the age of eight. So Zephaniah is probably in his 20s, something like that, when uh, when I think when Zephaniah is ministering. So covenantal themes are huge. And of course, the the sanctions of the covenant, the blessings and cursings loom very large in the book of Zephaniah. So we'll look at some of that at the very beginning. But then we're also going to look at some uh, hermeneutical assumptions or methodology. I do want to spend a little bit of time because this is good in both of these themes, actually, the, the covenantal theme as well as the hermeneutical method are applicable not just to Zephaniah, but I think to any book of the Bible, particularly of the prophetic books. We're going to uh, look at the fact that Christ is the priority, uh, that although uh, he's not mentioned you know, in the book of Zephaniah, and in fact, interestingly enough, Zephaniah is never quoted in the New Testament, uh, one of the few books of the Old Testament that there's no direct quote, Mm. Uh, one of the few books of the Old Testament, there's no direct quote in the New Testament. There mm. are some uh, allusions, uh, you know, there are some things that could have been pulled out of, of Zephaniah. The closest thing we might have to a quote is in Revelation, and we'll take a look at that when we get there, but uh, not it, it's not directly. So when we look at the fulfillment of the big theme of Zephaniah, the day of the Lord, how do we recognize this as the coming of God, the coming of Christ? And so we're going to look at some hermeneutical assumptions uh, and recognize us. I think our, our good friend, who I've been so excited to hear more and more on Reformed Forum, Lane Tipton, uh, puts it, I think he puts it something to the effect that the Old Testament demands that Jesus fulfill it. And so we're going to examine that. Where are the demands on the Messiah that we find in the book of Zephaniah? So that's going to kind of be the 30-minute intro, which I think is applicable to, you know, just about any Old Testament book. But then in the second lesson, we're going to look at the context. And so even before we get into the text, of course, we're going to get into the context. You know, they say in, in uh, real estate, there's one important, or there's three important things about real estate, right? right? Location, location, location. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's three important things, I think, about the foundation for biblical interpretation of this context, context, context. What's going on at the time Zephaniah? And this is where I, I think it gets really interesting because it's easy for us to read First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles, in this case, First Second Kings and Second Chronicles, and, you know, just kind of go over these kings, Manasseh, bad, Ammon, bad, Josiah, <laughs> oh, good, most of the time, you know, and we just kind of read through, but we don't examine the intrigue that's going on behind the scenes. And so mm -hmm. this looms really large in Zephaniah. He's the only prophet that we get a genealogy for in the very first verse. He goes back four generations and it links himself to Hezekiah, probably Hezekiah the king is what he's referring to, although some would dispute that, but that's probably Hezekiah the king that he's making reference to. And so it there's a built-in context to Zephaniah that's perhaps even more pronounced than other prophets. So, you know, for example, Joel doesn't even have a context, which is one of the challenges of, of interpreting Joel is we have no idea who this guy is or when he ministered. And uh, we have an idea, of course, of where he ministered, but not, I don't know, Zephaniah nails it for us. And so it's important for us, if Zephaniah takes the time to nail for us when he's ministering, it's important for us to take the time to explore, okay, what's this context? And so we're going to take a look at some of the world events and the intrigue that goes on behind the scenes and what's happening in Israel. And I don't want to give the lesson here, but the bottom line is what's happening in Israel is they're in this unique situation where they are between the demise of the Assyrians and the ascendancy of the Babylonians. And so uh, Judah is feeling pretty good about themselves. And you see that in the book of Zephaniah, you see it in the book of Amos is, is somewhat similar. And Zephaniah and Amos share a lot of similarities, literally and content wise as well and context wise. And uh, we're going to look at, at 
the machinations of the uh, the kings of Judah, you know, for example, I mean, they'll, they some of them, Manasseh, for example, who is the uh, two kings. So there's Manasseh, Ammon, and then Josiah. Manasseh, uh, horrifically cruel. Uh, it just slaughters people, this king of Judah. He, he offers his own children as uh, sacrifices to, you know, the false gods. And uh, and as a result, people hate him. And so he, he levels a tax on the rich, you know, because that's how you get popular with people. And then he uses that money to pay off the Assyrians to leave him alone and, and not only leave him alone, but kind of prop him up on the throne a little bit because he's unpopular. And he's, he passes off the scene as Ammon's only around. And Zephaniah's probably born during the reign of Manasseh. And then Ammon's only around for a couple of years. He's no good. And then Josiah comes and we see this reform uh, that takes place as the law is discovered. And, and then that's why we see the Deuteronomic theme. So that all of that is, is context in the background. Of course, the Assyrian struggles uh, as, as they're being pushed out. And bear in mind, too, that uh, Zephaniah is being written. Uh, well, he's prophesying and I'm assuming being written. I think we can assume that fairly safely. We won't take a lot of time to look at that. But uh, you know, there are some scholars who think that that chapters two, particularly the good parts, you know, the 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 promised parts of Zephaniah had to be written by somebody else because you can't write all this bad stuff and <laughs> also write good stuff. None, none of the prophets did that, right? Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, some people think that it's it's just all bad news. But for the for the most part, remember that Zephaniah, as it's written, so it's probably written somewhere around 630, 640, 625, somewhere around there. It's not exactly dated for us. Is written just less than a generation before Nineveh is destroyed. Uh, that's, that's huge. This, this is all here in this background. And Nineveh is going to be overrun by Babylon. That sets up the whole rest of the, the other stuff that's going on here. And, and just, just that wonderful context. In the backdrop of this, then, is world history. But it's important for us to remember, and, and we're going to put this in the context of Zephaniah, world history serves redemptive history. Mm. The, the focus of the Bible is not the nations that are right. all around That's right. Israel. They'll come into focus mm -hmm. in Revelation, right? Every tongue, tribe, language, and nation. It's about the people of God. Uh, and yet at the same time, Zephaniah is going to have a large section, uh, comparatively speaking, in terms of real estate in the book, devoted to the condemnation of the Gentile nations for the persecution of Israel. But all of that's context. And so that's how we're going to approach it in the first two lessons. But then after that, uh, breaking it down then into the remaining uh, seven or eight lessons uh, on the text itself of Zephaniah and more or less going verse by verse and looking behind the scenes and exploring the protological themes that are here. And I'll, I'll uh, mm -hmm. pause to give you some, some air here in just a second, but the protological themes that are in Zephaniah are going to come out throughout uh, the text. Themes of creation, themes of Babel, uh, themes of Exodus. Uh, these all are very prominent in the book of Zephaniah, and we'll explore those as we move through the text. That's wonderful. I mean, some people may w wonder what this title means in terms of Zephaniah's protology in eschatology. I'll let you uh, explain that or expand upon that, but just at least from my vantage point to Typically, we can divide up uh, biblical, the, you know, redemptive or covenant history into three giant eras, either protology or the era from creation until the fall into sin. But then uh, you have typology, which is the, the uh, time in between, but most uh, specifically demonstrated in uh, the theocracy in the nation of Israel, and then that which led up to it in terms of the exodus and their wilderness wanderings uh, through the through uh, the barren wilderness unto the promised land. But then eschatology is what breaks through, uh, through the, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So we have three sons of God that represent each of these eras, so to speak, Adam, Israel, and our Lord Jesus. Uh, we live in an overlap of the ages. We don't live in protology, but we live uh, in an overlap now because of Christ's finished work. We live in an overlap of this typological era, so to speak, or at least the era of, of, of needing redemption, and then that which is broken through in the kingdom and consummation of Jesus Christ. Obviously, we don't live in, a, in an era like people lived in the time of Israel with the sacrifices and everything that, you know, under the, under the law of Moses. 
but you get my point. So the question here is, the promise of the future, that which is eschatological, uh, the consummation that we have promised to us and secured to us through Jesus Christ, is the same end point that God promised to and offered to Adam in the garden. And so very frequently we see a lot of the same themes uh, uh, in creation narrative and in creation imagery reappearing at the end of the Bible. So Mark, I'd love for you to explain how Zephaniah uh, picks up on many of these biblical themes and how we see protology and eschatology uh, refracted through covenant theology in this wonderful little book. Yeah, Uh, you find it in the creational themes that become the source for ultimate themes. Mm. So Zephaniah takes us back to creation and and the theme of the day of the Lord. And and if our listeners have not listened to Elaine Tipton's address at your last conference, I think it was the last address where he talks about uh, Meredith Klein's, you know, he, he takes us largely through God, heaven, and Armageddon. And yeah, he talks stuff about on indoxation. Indoxation, right? The <laughs> images of the spirit. And right. if, uh, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to overdo this, but I think that the day of the Lord, the arrival, the appearance of God, there's a prototypical aspect of that in Genesis 1-2. The spirit arrives. Sure. And and this is this is um, before the fall, and before the fall, the spirit arrives and he moves, he he vibrates over creation, and that which is uh, that which is there uh, takes and, and which is formless and and, and void. This this uh, um, ominous, chaotic, uh, in a sense, looking thing to us that he gives shape to. And he does that by creating things in a certain order, the rulers and the realms. Uh, and, you know, and Klein, of course, talks about those things in first and fourth day and second and fifth and third and sixth day and how the rulers and the realms go together. You, you're talking about the upper register and the lower register. Right. All these things are happening, you know, mm-hmm. just, but what happens when you get to the book of Zephaniah is a decreation. Uh, things are being decreated and Zephaniah uh, takes creation and pulls it apart. And now immediately, you know, if you're thinking with, uh, you know, the New Testament, your New Testament hat on, which which we do, but of course we want to think of how Zephaniah thinks this, but automatically we're thinking forward, right? We're thinking to, even though Zephaniah is not quoted in the New Testament, we're thinking forward to First Thessalonians, uh, cloud imagery that's there at God's return. We're looking for, we're thinking of Peter, uh, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. And Zephaniah lists the order of creation in reverse, and this stuff is going to get pulled apart. Interestingly, he doesn't exactly uh, quote Genesis. He brings in themes from Psalms and themes from Deuteronomy. Uh, so there's some development in the way that he uh, speaks of it. But that that protological theme is found in a decreation event, which leads to a recreation event. And that recreation event doesn't just happen at the end. We are made new creatures in Christ. So that recreation event uh, commences with the coming of God, which is Emmanuel, God with us, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That creation event commences. And of course, that points us forward to uh, the well, what we some often refer to as the second coming, because that's convenient language to use. Mm. But the finality or the consummate coming mm-hmm. of Jesus, and so you see this uh, decreation, recreation language, especially, of course. It, it, it do, and what's interesting is in the way that Zephaniah is arranged is that the decreation happens almost immediately. The book just starts at mm-hmm. right out of the gate with this is all getting ripped apart, and then it ends with it's all getting rebuilt uh, in the great day of the Lord, the coming of God. So there's protology in that eschatology. And then there are also uh, very predominant uh, Pentateuchal themes, not only found in Deuteronomy, but also there are, I I think, 
uh, thematic elements that relate to Exodus. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? Because what is the Exodus event? It is a another picture, another event of the day of the Lord. Zephaniah talks about cloud imagery. And of course, that takes us again all the way back to Genesis chapter one, but it also takes us to uh, the Exodus event, the pillar of fire, the cloud that yeah. leads the people of God out, the day of darkness, thick darkness. What mm-hmm. is that Pentateuchal uh, event? And again, Exodus, think of the judgment upon Pharaoh, the day of darkness that comes upon him, the death that comes upon him, the, uh, the pagan nation faces the judgment of God, which we see in Zephaniah chapter two. So there are, um, and back. Babel. Babel is, uh, is a fascinating one as well. And again, not to teach the, you know, the whole lesson here, but Babel's fascinating because who is the builder of Babel? Oh, it's also the same guy who mm. is the builder of Nineveh, which is about to be destroyed in 612 within a generation of Nimrod, right? Within a generation of, of Zephaniah ministering. So the mm. builder of Babel, the builder of of Nineveh, which is about to face God's judgment, they're about to be ripped apart, just like Babel was ripped apart. The the dissolution of, and, the, and then you get into that whole theme of the dissolution of human kingdoms. But then uh, you've got, um, and, and but the beauty of it then, and this is where protology meets eschatology then, is in this new creation, there's going to be, Zephaniah uses uh, the terminology of a pure language. Uh, There is going not just to be a restoration of Babel, uh, but a complete reversal of Babel and healing of Babel. And where does that begin? And and so you see these themes in in Zephaniah of day of the Lord themes. And where does that begin? Well, it points us to Pentecost. You were talking a minute ago, uh, Camden, about how the New Testament um, preachers preach redemptive historically. Oh, I don't yeah. think there's any better example of that than Peter. Peter in Acts 2, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the first sermon mm-hmm. of what we would call, you know, the New Testament church. This is the mm-hmm. inaugural sermon. Here is the church. And he announces that his sermon text is the book of Joel, which parallels F and I in many ways, which is why some people think that Joel is actually written um after Zephaniah because he references so many other prophets, but it's written after uh or uh, Peter, I'm sorry, is referencing uh, the prophet Joel. That's his sermon text, but where is he? he? He's bicycling through the Bible. He takes us all the way through uh, to show us the consummate glory of God is found in uh, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. And and then another thing we're going to see as a result of this then, um, and, and uh, actually, if I can, I don't know if I'm on camera, so pardon me for turning around. There's this wonderful <laughs> quote by Gerhardus Voss, if you don't hey. mind. Sure. We'll um, always stop for Voss. Oh, okay. Good. Fire we'll away. <laughs> yeah. So, so listen, uh, I, I, just, I have to get this quote in here because I think you see this. And, and by the way, and just to put another plug in for the second best podcast on the reform forum, uh, Proclaiming Christ, with, with my apologies for um, what was the other <laughs> the one? The Robin Bob oh, show. Oh, man. What, <laughs> can't even remember the name. <laughs> Theology simply profound. Okay. Oh yeah, Our beloved brothers, kidding. Robin Bob. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But anyway, uh, just another plug for proclaiming Christ here is that one of the things that we try to do is show how um, how there is no absence of application when you're preaching Christ, and and, and it's one thing that that has always fascinated me about Voss as many people who say Voss didn't do application effect. Certain people say Voss didn't even preach, but. Uh, Listen to what Voss says, and this is what I think we see in Zephaniah, and we can do this, and I want to do this as we go through the class. Zephaniah says this, and this is on his sermon called um, Christ Deliberate Work, which I think is on Mark 10, if I remember correctly. He says this, and bear in mind, Zephaniah's prosecution of the people of Judah because they have broken the law of God. Uh, They can't keep his word. They continue to, to disobey, right? Voss says, the impossibility of our doing what Jesus did furnishes the most constraining argument for making the spirit in which he did it the supreme governing principle of our Christian life and for recognizing that there are, now get this phrase, there are simply no limits which we can set upon its application. Hmm. There are no limits to the application here. It points us to Jesus. 
And so I forget what your original question was, but the bottom line is it all points us to Jesus Christ. And that's what the day of the Lord points us to, the glory of God seen in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, sure. Amen, brother. I, I want to get you uh, focused right back on, on Jesus Christ uh, through a different question that's in the same ballpark. Oh, I found this so helpful. In, uh, I was reading your thesis, uh, as I mentioned, and you use the language of uh, the, the central theme of the day of the Lord having a, a threefold or a three-level expectation in terms of Zephaniah's prophecy. I wonder mm-hmm. if you could walk us through those those three levels. We already we talked about the typological and, and Christ and the consummation, but draw out that threefold structure a bit more for us. And I'm hoping you could you could comment on how Zephaniah's sensitivity to both the the near and then that the far term fulfillments can just help us be better readers of uh the prophetic works in general. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, Ryan, I would have to say at this point, I, I probably have changed a bit in my understanding of that since I wrote this. And I, I wouldn't present it, I think, in the same way in the class as I've, I've done it. So in the thesis, the class isn't going to be like a repetition of the thesis, although it's going to you know, have a lot of the same stuff in it. Um, I think we can see three levels prophetically, but I don't want to overplay that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that as FNI is writing this, First of all, he's not conscious, I think, of these three levels. Uh, but secondly, it's not, it's not explicit in the text that these levels are being referred to. And even when we come to the New Testament in light of the New Testament, we can, we can read that back into it. But we have to be careful when we're interpreting any book of the Old Testament or any book for that matter, that we don't read back into things, things that weren't there, although we can find the completion of things as we see them further explicated in the New Testament. But I will say, I think we can at least see a fulfillment at three different levels. One of them is, of course, the restoration. And this is where, again, world history becomes really fascinating just because of the way God moves, right? Read the book of Isaiah and, and try not to be intrigued at the way God moves Cyrus, uh, and and the whole idea of the the restoration of the people of God, 536. So he's writing around 640. Jerusalem is the, the date that we usually give it for the uh, the exile into uh, Babylon would be 586. <clears throat> and so uh, 536 or so, generation or so, generation and a half later, Cyrus comes. Uh, gets rid of the Babylonians. Babylonians are nasty, nasty people, a little better than the Assyrians, but they're nasty, nasty people. So Cyrus comes and it's pretty easy for him in a way to take over certain areas because people don't like the Babylonians anyway. And Cyrus has this great policy. It's it's a decent policy, right? And the policy is that no, I'm going to send people back to their land and I'm going to have them be productive and pay your taxes and build my empire. Uh, he's a remarkable ruler, calls himself the king of kings. And uh, just that that whole scene of the return from exile is all around that uh, the the ascendancy of the Persian Empire and all, all the stuff that happens there. And, and I, so I think that's the first level there. There certainly is, I think, in what we're reading in Zephaniah, the anticipation that, yeah, you people are going to run into trouble. You're going to go into exile, but you, you're going to be restored. But of course, we know, reading Ezra and reading Nehemiah, that that restoration isn't the restoration. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's not all that Zephaniah is anticipating. But I, th- I think there's a second level, and that second level, then, I think we find in Pentecost, the arrival of God, uh, the, the pure language that is being spoken at Pentecost. And again, it's not... It's, it's not the end. It, it, this is not the pure language. They're given the ability to speak in the languages of those who are listening, but the gathering of the people of God that we see there, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus ascends into heaven. He says, it's better that I go away. He goes away, sends the Spirit, proceeds from the Father of the Son. God visits at Pentecost. And then that that's a thematic element that I think is anticipated in Zephaniah. And then, and we also, by the way, part of that is the the fire that comes, things of that nature. So a lot of the imagery that's used in Zephaniah is going to be used uh, and seen in Pentecost. And then of course, the third would be the consummate uh, glory, the 
uh, the coming of Christ. But interestingly, I think when the Messiah comes, we also see a tri-level arrival, if you will. We, we see the birth of Christ, we see Pentecost, uh, the sending of the Spirit, and then, of course, we see the consummate uh, coming of, uh, of Christ, the, the coming of glory. And that's the recreation theme, the end of the book of Zephaniah, uh, that, that beautiful story of the restoration of the people of God. If I can just read, uh, in case we don't get there, um, I just want to read the, the last couple of verses of, of Zephaniah. Um, at that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, and, and, and if you're not thinking Pentecostal themes here, right? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a picture of this in that, but that's not all there is. At that time, I will gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Yeah, and and so the the and and, and what what this is pointing toward then is and ultimately um, this this will take us in our lessons as we move through here to uh, the church, the work of the church. God does this work, begins this work in the church of Jesus Christ, and it's part of the Great Commission. A great commission is spreading the glory of God all over the globe in the way that Adam was to spread the glory of God all over the globe and failed in that. But we, through Christ, Christ does that through uh, his church. Mm -hmm. Mark, tell us a bit about, uh, along those lines, the ending uh, of the book of Zephaniah. One of the, if anyone knows a verse out of Zephaniah, it might be chapter 3, verse 17, (laughs) which speaks about he will quiet you with his love. And uh, just the the beautiful restoration, you do see judgment, uh, covenant themes are replete throughout the book, uh, but we see God's covenant faithfulness, even if chesed isn't present there uh, as a word, um, certainly the covenant theme is is uh, there everywhere. And you do find judgment, but we find restoration for God's people, the people whom he has chosen, and not being restless, not being torn up, not being... Uh, surrounded by or harassed by enemies, but being made quiet uh, in the love of God. Uh, I can't help but think of other themes we might see, like in Isaiah 65, for example, the new heavens and the new earth. We Mm -hmm. rest. uh, We each have our own fig tree. (laughs) And um, other themes. Is it Jeremiah where uh, the Lord says that, uh, the prophet says that he may, that the Lord can certainly restore all that the locusts have eaten? And uh, Joel, just yeah. big theme in Joel. Right? Yeah, that too. Uh, yeah, of course. And yes. uh, 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 the restoration that we are are made whole uh, because we receive our inheritance. We receive God Himself, and we rest mm-hmm. in Him. So, mm-hmm. what can what can uh, students and uh, uh, of this course, whether in person or in video later on, expect this to go? Uh, do we end on a hopeful note, or is this uh, covenantal doom and gloom? The whole way through, <laughs> <laughs> just bad news all the way through. Fire um, and brimstone. No. Yeah, I, Zephaniah, Zephaniah just ends on it. It has to be one of the most beautiful verses mm-hmm. in the Bible. Uh, uh, o. Palmer Robertson has a great commentary on Zephaniah, and he refers to three seventeen as the John three sixteen of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and, and I, I think that's such a good way to put it. And I. I the, the the climax of Zephaniah, and, and this is why some critical scholars say, well, the, this obviously was something somebody added later. This couldn't have been Zephaniah. But what we have to understand is that the day of the Lord, this, for the people of Israel, I'll get to the good news here in a minute, but for the people sure. of Israel, they're, you know, they're in a time when, hey, the Assyrians aren't bugging them anymore. Uh, they're expanding their borders. Mm-hmm. Things are being built. Things are going well. And what are we worried about? Uh, everything's fine. We don't have, there's no concerns. We don't have to worry about our sin, any of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And, and what, what Zephaniah is doing is saying, no, uh, you're you know, terrible sinners. All this bad stuff is going to happen to you. But then the restoration. And to go uh, over these just these last couple of verses, I love how these work out. Look at verse 14. Sing. Aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Mm-hmm. Daughter of Zion is frequently referenced in the Old Testament, particularly in the Song of Solomon, uh, interestingly. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. What do mm-hmm. you mean? There's been all this bad news. 
<laughs> says, I don't know, sing with all your heart. Why do we sing? Because God is in your midst. Mm -hmm. There it is. That's the height of the covenant promise. This is it. Uh, this is the, the the core of the covenant promises that God will dwell with you. This is what Adam enjoys in the garden in a probationary state. But now God will dwell in your midst in a way that far surpasses what you had before. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Mm -hmm. So we're told to sing. Why do we sing? Because God sings mm -hmm. over us. Mm -hmm. You get to the New Testament, you get to the book of Hebrews. Who sings in the congregation of God's people? Jesus. Jesus yeah. Why yeah. do we sing? Because Jesus sings. So the whole blessed and undivided Trinity is revealed to us and causes us to sing and rejoice, recognizing and Back to what I started with, the people of Israel thought, day of the Lord, no big deal, because everything's fine here. But the day of the Lord, they needed to understand, and we need to understand, is a day of judgment for those who oppose God. But it's also a day of great rejoicing and salvation for those who are united to Jesus Christ that causes us to sing. The church's hymn is about Jesus. The church's voice raises up singing the glories of our covenant God because he will deal with all our oppressors. And of course, you see, I think here, references that, although, again, Zephaniah is not directly quoted in the New Testament, that doesn't mean there are not very clear links to mm -hmm. the New Testament. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcast. I will change. Who does that? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Right. This is the work of Jesus who comes, and he's healing the lame. He's gathering his people. And this is, uh, Jesus doesn't perform miracles so that we can say, oh, wow, oh, um, that's impressive, or, oh, he's powerful, or even necessarily simply that we can say, oh, he's God, mm -hmm. which is true. That's certainly part of it. He does it because, and this is what we'll start with at the very beginning, the Old Testament demands that the Messiah do this, and Jesus comes, and he does it completely, fulfills every expectation of him. So we'll find that everything Zephaniah sings over, we sing over, is because Jesus sings in our midst, and we sing of his uh, return. It's a great uh, lesson, by the way, in singing. I'm not going to spend a whole mm. lot of time. <laughs> they don't want to hear me well, sing. It adds context but, for a theology of worship, certainly. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's what's going on here. And then, of course, these themes that uh, then consummate in the book of Revelation, when uh, and, and several times in here, right? I will gather the outcast. I will gather you together among all the peoples of the earth. What are we looking at here? The purified language. What are we being pointed forward to? Uh, people from every tongue, tribe, language, nation are going to be gathered around the throne. The, the church is the, maybe to use a word that people don't use anymore, I don't know what they use now, but the church is the multicultural society, if you will. Hmm. The people from every tongue, tribe, language, and nation will be gathered together. And, and glorify God and sing in a pure language. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's great hope at the end of the book of Zephaniah. Very good. Uh, Ryan, why don't we go over the details really quick? I mean, this is just wetting the appetite, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's tremendous. I'm hoping people would want to learn more, and they could certainly do so by attending the course and, and learning a ton more. So we have the dates, August 12th and 13th, 2022. How can people sign up? We only have 12 spots available. So how do we, how yeah, do people reserve their place? There's only 12 spots and, and, you know, they might already be taken by our, uh, the folks on our private discord server. Um, but we, we, we never know. <laughs> yeah. I haven't <laughs> we, checked with the registration. Well, no, I, I jest, but I'm just saying, you know, if you want to get on that private Discord server, we'd love to have you sure. uh, for a donation of any amount. Um, but we did release it there. Uh, if you are a email subscriber, you'll receive the information in the email that'll go out you will have already the day received it. that this drops. <laughs> and you can visit us on the website, reformforum.org uh, slash, slash events. It'll be there. Right. Um, and there will be two registration links. They'll take you right to Eventbrite. Uh, where you can sign up. So we really hope to see you August 12th and 13th for the evening and then the whole morning together.
Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we'll be on the website, reformedforum.org. You can find it under the events panel on the top menu. If you want a direct link uh, just to this event page, reformedforum.org slash Zephaniah 2022, Zephaniah 2022. We'll have a link to that in the episode description. And uh, there'll be plenty of links available for you to click on and head on over uh, from there to register for the event on eventbrite.com, which is what we use to manage our tickets and all that sort of thing. Again, August 12th and 13th, we hope to see you here. We'd love to connect with you. If you've got any questions, you can send them on over to mail at reformedforum.org. But I do want to thank everybody for listening and for watching, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.